Savior to begin to call upon his name in the best way you know how. Bless his wonderful name. Thank him. He brought you through this and he brought you through that. Come on and take a moment and begin to just worship and decree his goodness over your life. I can't hear anybody saying anything. Come on, if you know the Lord has brought you out, if you know the Lord has delivered you, if you know him to be a healer, come on and open up your mouth and begin to worship him, begin to bless him. Come on, let worship roll out from the fruit of your lips and begin to bless him. Come on. To all of our online members that are worshiping with us, just begin to worship with the Lord and begin to call his name, begin to bless his name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All the glory belongs to you. All the glory belongs to you. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Thank you so much. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. Um, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice. I normally rejoice. I always rejoice. Amen. And I'm so grateful that God has given us, amen, another day, another opportunity, amen, to bless his name. We have a busy day today, so I do not intend to be before you long. I have to preach a funeral after this, and then it's five o'clock service. So I want to share with you what the Lord had spoken to me. Are you ready for a word today? Amen. Amen. Look around you and tell somebody that you didn't ride the church with. Tell them, I'm ready for a word today. Devil been messing with me all week and trying to bully me in my spirit and trying to tell me what I can and can't have. Make a decree with me today with your fists and say the devil is a liar. I come too far and I'm not going to give up now. Can I get a witness, somebody? Can somebody decree it with me? I come too far. I've been through too many storms and I've been through too many challenges and I know what it's like to, to be in a dying need, but God delivered me from it all. And because of that, I need a word today. I'm sorry, I thought I was preaching to some folks that need something from God. I want you to take about 15 seconds and open up your mouth and decree to the Lord, God, I need a word today. And if you believe you're going to get it, I want you to go ahead and give him praise before you get it. Open your mouth and begin to bless him. Open your mouth and begin to praise him. Open your mouth and begin to thank him. Hallelujah. I had to make sure, Sister Jasmine, I was in the right church today. I want to preach to some folks that know God is a deliverer. I want to preach to some folks that know God is a healer. How many of you know he's a way maker? How many of you know he'll bring you out? Say it to your neighbor, if he did it before, he'll do it again. Find you another neighbor and preach to him and say, if he did it before, he will do it again. And I got the faith to prove it. And I got the praise to prove it. Come on, open up your mouth and tell God thank you. Take a moment. Take a moment and look behind you. Look behind, don't look at nobody. Look behind you till you can see where God brought you from. When you can see where God brought you from, I dare you to open up your mouth and say, God, I want to thank you. God, 
I want to praise you. God, I want to give you glory for all of the hell you brought me through. When I look back over my life and all you brought me through, I, I, I can't help but give you praise. I can't help but give you thanks. Open up your mouth and tell the Lord thank you. Tell somebody, I know where he brought me from. Come on, tell your neighbor, the devil thought he had me. But I switched beats. Y'all are hearing me. I used to dance to the beat of the devil. But God put a song in my spirit. So when I think now of the goodness of Jesus, there's a song that rings down in my belly. I can't help but give God praise. I can't help but give God thanks. So say to your neighbor, you can look at me all you want. But what God have done I know what he brought me through I know what the doctor said I know it should have been another way but God but God I want to preach, y'all have a seat, for y'all make me dance. Come on, come on and find you a neighbor and say, neighbor, something has happened to me, but I can't explain with my mouth, but God has given me a song with a beat in my spirit. And when I come to church, I don't have to have no organ. When I come to church, I don't have to have no drums. But because God has brought me out, God has pulled me through. And when I get my chance, I'm gonna give him praise. All right, y'all, please have a seat. If you can. Now, I'm not going to stop you from praising them. Because I don't know your story. Tell your neighbor, it's very possible that your next praise might save your life. I don't know what the enemy would throw at you, but it's something about when praise is going up, sends down a shield over your family, a shield over your life, a shield over your mind, a shield over your spirit. When praises go up, something happens in my life that every time the devil throw a cancer, every time the devil throw a rick rock, it has to boomerang. But I got a praise that protects my life. I got a praise that goes before me. I got a praise that saves my children. I got a praise that saves my family. I got a praise that saved my church. I got a praise that saved my mind. I got a praise that protects my heart. Somebody say yes. Okay. It was necessary.
Say it with me. It was necessary. Every father should remember that one day his son will follow his example instead of his advice. Every mother should remember the same. One day your daughter will follow your example instead of her advice. Preacher, why would you say something like that? Whether or not you believe it or not, we are living in a day that the results of how our children are are because of the way their parents are. It's nothing for children nowadays to talk back and be very disrespectful and feel that it's okay to tell their parents what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. And we have allowed this to happen because we so into church that we forgot to raise our children. And we miss this content when it says train up a child in the way it should go. The problem is you can't do that if you don't go. Okay, how much you send your children to school and to church, it doesn't matter if you don't go. Because they're going to eventually follow your example. So in essence, if you are halfway into church and halfway not, then so will your children be. You will breathe up a church member that talks about the pastor if you talk about the pastor. Oh, I know I'm talking. And if you don't give, and if you don't tithe, then you will breathe that same spirit. And if you can't celebrate others when God has blessed them, and when you can't rejoice with others, and you wonder why your children don't, because they never see you do it. So it is necessary that we stop looking at some things and pay attention to what's really going on. And I would be the first to say that there are mothers who have had children that are too young. Because when, you, when God blesses you with your child, he expects you to raise them. Not put them off. And so, every day you read in the paper a, a story of a of a young black male that has been shot or that has robbed somebody without ever understanding what about the parents. And if the parents don't invest into the children, into their spirit, then they will seep and wonder and search for a place of belonging. And most of the time, that is not good. So it's necessary that we remember this. Here's another one. Uh, it's absolutely no way that two people, apostle, can hate each other and love God. Okay, that was too deep. The Bible says it this way. Uh, you know, we love because he loves us. So if anyone says, I love God, yet hate his brother, the Bible calls you a liar. I know y'all want me to move on to something else, don't you? He said, and for anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot, oh, y'all ain't hearing me, you cannot love God, whom you have not seen. 
So it is impossible that if you are in this church and if you are listening to me, whether you are online, if you hate someone, you can't love God. That's why it's imperative, you know, hear me, sanctuary, that we search our hearts and get bitterness out of our hearts because bitterness would turn your heart into a heart of hatred. It's, it's imperative that if someone has done something to you, that you ask God to give you the wisdom and the strength to get over it and go to them and say, listen, it's all good. It's all God. I forgive you. And check this out. When you do that, then you can help me preach this because then you can say it was necessary. When something, Pastor Rosling, is necessary, it simply means it had to happen. It has to happen. People that hate on you, it has, it's necessary. Now you may think it's not really necessary for them to do that, but they did Jesus the same way. And, and hear me, Elder Cora. The hatred that they had for Jesus was part of his plan. It was necessary. I'm going to talk about two instances, and I can't be long. But it's very important to understand, watch this, that my necessary may not be your necessary. But that doesn't mean it's unnecessary. And when you can't respect what's necessary in another's life, then you don't in, then, then you don't invite what's unnecessary. Or if you can't, let me say it this way: if you can't respect what's necessary in somebody else's life, then you invite what's unnecessary into your own. You know why you got so many, so many and drama situations in your life because you're so worried about what everybody else's life got going on. If you would watch and monitor your, ooh, your own life, things be a whole lot better. And I'm going to talk to you about something in the Bible, about a, about a woman who many of us have probably really not paid a lot of attention to, but she's been in the Bible for a long time. And this is in 2 Kings chapter 4. She is called the Shunammite woman. And, and I, I want you to see something that God showed me, and I want to share it with you. And I promise you, I can't go through all of this, but I got to get to another one. But, but it was necessary how all of this played about. Not the first woman, the second woman. The first woman talks about the death of the widow. But then there's another woman who's a Shunammite woman who, who had an issue going on. And, and now watch this. Now, she, she notices the man of God always tarrying and walking by. And obviously, he must carry himself, hear me, in a God-fearing way. There must have been something about Elisha that says to her, you know, I can trust him. And I can trust the man of God that he proclaims to be. I don't care how much you preach, how much you sing. You've got to still have to earn the trust of people. And here, here he is. He's the man of God. And so he's recognized as one who carries himself as the man of God. And, she, and he wins the heart of a wealthy woman. She is so impressed with him that she says to him, every time you come this way, stop here and eat. And she constrained him, which means that she did it with force. She did not let him pass by without making sure that the man of God was took care of. And her word and her trust was so powerful and her discernment was so powerful that she went to her husband, y'all ain't hearing me, and says, let us build a room for him. And you know, you know, that must be some kind of trust because ain't no brothers. 
Don't let no woman build no room for no another man. Oh, y'all done got deep on me. Vice versa. Ain't no sisters gonna let no man build no room for no another, no another, no another, another woman. Ain't even nothing to pray about. They already know that answer. So Puffy, it was that when he walked by, she says, you know what? Let us build a little chamber for him. Let us build this, and we're going to put a table in there and put a bed in there and a stool and a candlestick so that whenever he comes to us, he has a place to relax. He has a place to lay his head. He has a place that he can call home. So he comes in, and he's noticed this. And he says to his servant, Gehazi, he says, you know what? Um, call the Shunammite woman. I got to move quickly, y'all. Call her and, and let, me, let me see what's really going on with her. And so he calls her and she, he says to her, behold, um, you have been so careful. You have really took care of us. Every time we come to town, you even built me a room. So he says, what is it that you want? Do I need to speak to the king or to the captain of the host? And I want you to hear what this woman says. She says, watch this, I dwell among my own people. You know what that really means? That means I'm well took care of. Whenever these brothers trying to, trying to come at you, tell them, I dwell among my own people. You know what that means? That means I'm took care of. I don't need your money. Y'all ain't hearing me. I don't need your car. I don't need your house. I'm straight. I'm straight where I am. See, some of the problem with a lot of us is that when a person notices that we need something, they play on that need. But you got to tell people, I'm good. And when you leave, I'm good. And if you don't ever come back, I'm good. I dwell amongst my own people. <laughs> so he says, you know, uh, Gehazi, there has to be something. It has to be something that she needs. Gehazi, notice what Gehazi says. He says, she has no child. And her husband is old. Y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all ain't hearing me. <laughs> Y'all stop acting all deep. <laughs> she ain't got no children, but she got a rich husband. A rich husband that's old. In the day's time, he will be called a sugar daddy. I know, just look straight. Because when she said, I dwell among my own people, that means she took care of. He takes care of her. And that's what most women, I ain't going to go there. Am I doing all right, Sam? I just want to be took care of. Am I in the house? how fine you are, you can't pay no bills. Oh, Lord. Okay, how good you smell and how wavy your hair is. If you can't pay no bills, they don't need you. But the problem is, so many folks have settled. Knowing what they can't do, but you still settle. And Gehazi says to the man of God, She's, she don't have a child. And her husband is old. You know what that means, Deacon? What he's really saying? Can I put it in the day's term? Ain't but so much he can do. Oh, Lord, how much? 
Y'all don't like me. So the man of God says to her, he says, uh, about this season, in other words, around this time, according to the time of life, um, you will embrace a son. In other words, about this time, you will have a son in your arms. Now I need you to get this uh, because notice she's all, she never said what she wanted. And this is what happens to many of us. We want things, but we're too proud to admit it. Oh God. So obviously it must have been something that she wanted. But she settled with not having it because she was so well took care of. And just because you are well took care of in the physical does not mean that you are took care of in the spiritual. And so Elijah says to her, you're going to embrace a son. Listen to how bold she is. She said, uh, Um, sir, <laughs> do not lie to me. Hmm. I didn't even ask you for this. And I didn't tell you for this. And my husband, y'all ain't hearing me is old. So don't tell me that I'm going to have a son. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it this way. Do not lie to your handmaid. The woman conceived and bare a son at the time, at the season that Elijah had said, according to the time of life. Watch this. So the child was grown. Right? We get ready to shift this up for a second. The child was grown and it went outside one day and he was out there with his father and all of a sudden the child, Elder Harry, says, my head, my head hurts. The father said, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he put, she took the child and put him on her knees. And guess what happens? The child dies. So now the question becomes, Deacon, what do you do when the promise of God dies? I didn't even ask for this. But what happens when what you excited me for falls asleep? Some of you in here right now, you've held that promise in your hand, and it has died. And you have been running around so confused that you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, you don't know what to pray, you don't know what you don't know what auxiliary to be on, you don't know what to do in the ministry, you're trying to find your purpose, all because what God promised you has. I want you to hear this. I got the move, Apostle. It was necessary for the child to die. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The thing that you have been wanting to do, it was necessary for it to die. Some of you right now are going through hell at your house. It is necessary. Hell at your job. It's necessary. And right now, this is too deep. I don't know if I should say it. But you see what your children going through with their spouse and their lifestyle because of what you've done. 
you see a reflection of you in the day's time. Although you never told them what you did, they're still going through the exact same thing that you did. And what did you do when the promise has died? I got to move. Allow me to fast forward. The woman never does tell her husband that the son died. All he said was take him to his mama. But it never indicates that she told the husband, the son is dead. She goes straight to him and says, I got to get to the man of God. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. I got to get to the man who released this promise. Because if the same God is in him that birthed it, y'all ain't hearing me, is the same God that's in him that's going to raise him. So I got to get to the man of God. The husband speaks to Elder Troy and says, where you going? Y'all ain't hearing me. It, it ain't no new moon. It ain't no Sabbath. It, wh where are you going? All she said was, it will be well. I got to move it, other hand. She's, so she gets, she gets on the horses. She tells the guys, I don't even go slow. Get as fast as you can. I got to get to the lips that release this promise. Oh, God. And so she goes, and they're going to, to Mount Carmel. And, 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 and uh, Elijah saw her from a distance. I need you to hear this. God sees you from the distance. At least you know you're coming to him. Just because you may have hell and high water all around you, but just keep going to God. Here he is. He says to Gehazi, go and see what she wants. Now watch the woman. The woman saw him. He goes to her and he says, is it well? Is all well with your father, with your husband? Is all well with your son? She says, yes, all is well. Because sometimes you can't tell your problems to everybody. She got a dying son at home, but she not once said to Gehazi, my son is dead. She said, what? All is well. I need you to get that in your spirit right now. It may look like things are not going right, but who can say all is well? The children might be going backwards, but what? All is well. I don't have what I really want in the bank, but all is well. The doctor gave me a bad report, but all is well Gehazi you don't need to know what kind of problems I have I need to get this she gets to the man of God and Elijah says this, deacon. He says, Gehazi, take my staff and lay this staff on the son, on the dead child. Gehazi runs to the house, lays the staff on the dead child, but the child does not come to life because it was necessary, watch this, not only for the woman to deal with this, but for Gehazi so that Gehazi could know ain't no power in no staff. The power is in the word of God. God can use a staff but the word of God there's life. She says, can I put it in the day's term? You coming with me. And I ain't leaving until you come. You the one that said it. I 
didn't ask for a son. You said it. So since you said it, my son is laying here died, dead. You come and fix this. This is the kind of God that we serve. The kind of God that we serve. That if you give it to him, he'll fix it. The problem is, the promise has died, but you're trying to fix it. Every promise that dies, it dies for the reason only for God to fix. It does not die for it to die forever. It dies for it to be raised up again. And the devil deceives you by telling you, I told you it wasn't going to work. But you got a God you can go to and say, God, I need you to fix this. Come on and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got some problems. I got some hardships. But I know a God that I know can fix this. Somebody say, fix it, God. If you believe it, I dare you to jump on your feet and say it like you mean it. Fix it, God. I decree whatever it is you need God to fix is happening right now. If you believe it, I dare you to give God praise. I dare you to open up your mouth and say, God, I'm thanking you right now for fixing my problems. I'm praising you right now for turning it around. God, while you are fixing it, fix me. I get an attitude at times. Fix me. I get negative at times. Fix me. Every now and then, rebellion comes up. I need you to fix me. Turn the wrenches and fix me, God. And screw it, God. And fix me. I got to move, y'all. She said, did I ask you for a son? Did I desire a son? Do not deceive me. And as long as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave you. And he arose and went with her. He got to the house. They on the way there, Elder Lou. Guess what happened? Hazi comes running. Ah, uh, y'all, I put the staff on him, but he didn't. He's still, there's still no life in him. This is a message for Gehazi. He gets there. Here's what he does. He lays on the boy. Y'all know the rest of this. What is the story? What do you mean, Pastor? The boy had to die. It was necessary. I got to move. And this one is very familiar. And I'm going to say, and I'm going to close this because we have, we had, a, we had a busy day. In the book of Mark, the book of Mark, here's what happened. Judas is in the picture. I want to share with you a couple of things that the Lord said to me about 
this that I never really thought about until God spoke to me at about 4.30 this morning. The betrayal did not start in the garden. The betrayal started when Judas went to the chief priests and he asked them, what will you give me if I bring him to you? The betrayal. Watch this. Jesus is there eating Last Supper. You know what he says at the table down? One of you are going to betray me. But you know what? He was already betrayed. Ooh. So that's why it's so easy for people to sit with you that has betrayed you at a table. They already betrayed you. See, you thought that once he left, once Judas left, you thought he was going to betray him. No, he had already betrayed him. So what you mean, preacher? Help me out. That many of you are still sitting with people who have betrayed you. The betrayal, Paul, was revealed at the table. They kept saying, is it I? Is it I? And then in Matthew, it said, this elder had it. Judas, which betrayed him, meaning he was already betrayed while sitting at the table with Jesus. The garden, the garden was necessary. Because the garden was the place, well, watch me, hear me, oh, it's very, very, very deep. Would you hear me? The garden, Maria, was the place where the physical Jesus had a fight with the spiritual Jesus. Inquiring to God, was there another way for us to be saved? than for him to be sacrificed. So he's in that garden. He goes to the garden and he only takes three disciples. And then he says to them, y'all stay here. And he goes in a little farther and he starts to, he starts to get a sense of agony. And he was struggling because he couldn't quite the physical man did not want to die. But the spiritual man 